Hi, and welcome to the 41st episode of the Machine Ethics Podcast. This month, we're joined by both Ava Jaeger from the Serpentine Museum in London and Mercedes Bunce from King's College London. We have a freeway chat about AI design interfaces, artificial stupidity, artists being at the forefront of industrial change, AI and the art market, curation of AI art, and the Creative AI Lab, a space for learning, collaboration and works in progress and tools. For more episodes from us, check out the website machine-ethics.net. You can support us on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash machine ethics. And you can get in contact with us at hello at machine-ethics.net. Thanks again for Ava and Mercedes, and thanks for listening. I hope you enjoy. Could you both introduce yourself, um, possibly Mercedes first, and tell me who you are and what you do? Hi, I'm Mercedes Banth. I'm a senior lecturer uh, for Digital Society at King's College London at the Department of Digital Humanities. Hi, I'm Ava Jaeger. I am assistant digital curator at Serpentine Galleries, and I'm also an artist. I also work with um, machine learning and sort of at the intersection of ethics and technology. Yeah, but you, and you've done some, um, you've shown some pieces using some of that technology, haven't you? Yeah, actually, when we first met, I think um, my work was up at the Design Museum, and um, a work called Deep Digital Twin. It was a kind of seat, uh, it's called the Tete a Tete, where two conversation partners would face each other. It was a kind of French new era um, seating design made for women to efficiently gossip. Um, so they were kind of seated with their faces towards each other. And what we did was sort of reinterpret that um, design and then lay in an interface which um, allows you to see your conversation partner's uh, facial emotions being read. And we worked with a technology company, uh, a small startup, uh, to develop that interface specifically so that you could see certain layers that wouldn't normally be perceptible to uh, someone who's viewing some kind of like advertising and, and the company wouldn't want to show you sort of what it's picking up and reading. Mm. So there's, there's a lot of like kind of personal data stuff and um, in there that you, you kind of touched on, you know, how much does the system tell you about the things that it finds almost? Is that a consideration? That you were thinking of? Yeah, I mean, at that point, we were really interested in bringing the user into the interface and uh, allowing them to at least sort of view into the machine gaze on them um, and have a more direct, um, yeah, engagement. Mm. Um, so we we all first met at the, or rather, I met you both at the um, the interface of new AI. Um, which is this workshop that we all did, um, which you ran, Mercedes, yeah. at, which was all concerned with um, these te- types of technologies and how do we create interfaces so that um, artists and non-data um, scientists can get to grips with it, use it, and um, almost make it more transparent in its workings as well, right? So that was awesome. Um, I ha- has that kind of developed and, and progressed since in then you're thinking about or both of you are thinking about um, these types of technologies and, and that work? Yeah, um, so I think uh, we the new project we're talking about today, Creative AI Lab, is coming out of that first sort of two workshops at the Design Museum London. Um, that was about the interface and the core question or my core question was we have a new programming paradigm so machine learning is not that a computer scientist sits there and writes code but a computer scientist is creating um, a computer system and into the system uh, data is fed in and then the code comes out through the system analyzing thousands of data examples So my question was always, why isn't there a different interface? We all have this black box. Um, 
what we are getting at the moment, I mean, we're all working already with machine learning. Everyone who has texted today has used machine learning. But, you know, you get these decisions like, do you mean this word? Or um, we know that machine learning is also used in more that of ethical, difficult environments, such as the justice system or facial recognition in police. And there it's like it's a it's like bail or no bail or it's like you are a criminal or you're not a criminal. And this kind of black box decision was sort of weird to me because machine learning you know, it sort of uh, has so many parameters that are not visible on the interface side. Um, so then I talked to Eva quite a lot about it. Um, besides the workshop, we uh, sort of, our paths crossed because we share the same yoga studio, <laughs> that the same yoga class. And on one of these occasions, we sat down together and sort of, I explained my problem with the interfaces to Eva and Eva sort of, got out her smartphone, clicked on something, pulled it up into my face and said, do you mean like that? And I'm like, wow, what? And there it was. And for one of the projects, if I was looking after for the Serpentine Gallery for Hito Styles exhibition, um, a technology programmer and artist, she worked with Jules Laplace, if I what it was, right? Yep, Jules. Um, Jules, um, so Jules had programmed actually an interface for Hito to work with. And I was like, wow, um, this is really interesting. So I found, thanks to Eva and yoga, I found out that um, there are, these interfaces do exist and they exist in the art world. So, yeah, we created this project together that um, the Serpentine runs, uh, which is the Creative AI Lab. Great. Awesome. Um, so let's briefly step back and ask the first question that we usually ask on the podcast, which is we're talking about kind of AI, machine learning, all these sort of terms. Um, when you are talking about AI, um, what are you talking about specifically? What kinds of things um, does AI mean to you? If I just want to go first. <laughs> I can. Sure. I, can. Yeah. I mean, I I'm kind of interested in the way that artists position AI. Um, Mercedes mentioned uh, Hito Style, who re references not AI as artificial intelligence, but as AS, artificial stupidity. Um, and I think there's this um, really nice tension that artists often, you know, they're delivered that black box that Mercedes mentioned, and then they're very quickly opening it up investigating it, smashing it, uh, etc. cetera. Um, when I work with artists on a project, it's usually very, very specific. They're not talking about artificial intelligence as this sort of um, omniscient presence. Um, they're very specifically referencing, um, you know, a text generation model or a GAN or um, something that they've built themselves it's very technical yeah so there's a quite specific um in fact i i, I liked um the idea that um what you're saying there is sometimes that the, the thing of inquiry is the ai itself and how you take this black box and and you know smash it and, and do things with it and make something interesting out of that new kind of like tool almost is it's like a toy box what can i make with this new material Experimental artists are always like at the forefront of these new technologies in each industrial revolution. So artists have always played this like civic or countercultural role in digesting new technologies with all of us in culture. And um, so obviously, like for the fourth industrial revolution, this what they're calling the cyber physical systems, um, artists are also going to be engaging in AI as a kind of like construct as an idea. So often in our conversations, we put like quotation marks around AI because it's more of an idea at this point. Um, and I mean, this is sort of like something that our artistic director, Hans Ulrich, always references, the Marshall McLuhan quote that artists anticipate the future and they act as a kind of radar environment, takes on the function of indispensable perceptual training. And I really like this um, positioning of the artist within kind of civic space. And I guess 
what we're trying to do at Serpentine is provide not only artists with a platform, but also um, kind of improve the internal capabilities of not only Serpentine, but all of our peers to be able to deliver that kind of work. And that's where we need to bring in experts like Mercedes to, to help us and to develop things like the Creative AI Lab, which is basically that um, where a place where we can address all of the things that we've learned um, outside of an exhibition space. So we can take all of these kind of learnings from different projects, being deeply embedded with the production of those different projects, and then sort of um, workshop them, come up with toolkits, deliver tools to our peers, um, have conversations that aren't necessarily artwork specific, but maybe more about general practices, things like that. Great. Um, no, I think, uh, yeah, what I like very much about the creative AI approach is the idea of sharing. So um, the website that uh, we are creating at the moment is supposed to share a map of creative AI tools. Um, and we also want to explore, you know, classic issues. How is, uh, how is the usage of artificial intelligence in contemporary art shifting around? Um, how curators work and what skills are necessary within an art gallery or a museum. And um, we already started with a few more workshops in London, but also I've been in Norway once where there was a, the Research Council of Scandinavia meeting. And this is actually knowledge that people sort of in the art world, people sort of in the from the production side, people sort of are looking out um, to have. So, I mean, I think generally our idea of artificial intelligence is not very much up in the air, but very sort of down to actually technological functioning issues with the technology and so on. Great. Um, so I guess for me, kind of having this more kind of um, meta conversation about this sort of stuff, I guess, um, now we've talked about some of the kind of practical things that you guys have been working on. What is the this new material what what is it that ai is actually doing for artworks or the art world what is the possibility space and, and why should people care about it um i mean is it something useful to artists um and, and we've already covered something about the material itself the kind of the idea of um these new mediums getting explored um but is there something else um as well about using machine learning using ai tools in art that is worth doing i guess um well from the cultural studies perspective or it actually is very logical that artists are using machine learning in the sense that um computer science for years and years struggled to um operate or make meaning operational right so language and image these were the two fields where computer science really sort of hit a wall until machine learning and now uh, that we have machine learning it is very clear that the core area of culture which is meaning and the production of meaning um needs to be sort of measured out anew or sort of analyzed anew and i think um, there is no really playful field where we can test and, you know, look uh, under the hood of what is going on when we calculate meaning, not when we understand and interpret meaning or communicate, but when we calculate meaning. And I think um, that's so interesting and that's sort of what fascinates me and why I think, okay, of course artists should explore this medium. The other um, point is that I think it's actually also quite important. We see that um, machine learning solutions are applied everywhere in this world already, from our phones to tests with self-driving cars that are going on in London, and so on and so on, at least when the cars are not confined to stay put because of coronavirus, as it is at the moment. But um, I think there's not really a field where people can reflect on what's going on in our world. And I think art spaces are dedicated spaces where, you know, this shift uh, that's happening now can be reflected upon. So, yeah. I don't have so much to add to that. I mean, I guess the only thing would be to kind of flip your question because often um, artists are asked to use technology and in a way give that technology some kind of credibility. 
um, through you know artists engagement with it but artists can also be a part of intervening in designing or thinking about the systems itself themselves so actually um, you know there's a lot of value in artists interacting with machine learning at very early stages yeah and I think that in, it, it's already happening in some spaces um, um. Great. So I really like that, um, the, the, your explanations, um, because I haven't really thought about that, because a lot of the things that I see in the media and um, in exhibition spaces are kind of the products, right? And it's hard mm. to look at products and go, OK, like, how am I supposed to feel about this? Uh, why do they use AI? Is that apparent in the work? You know, all those sorts of things. So I, I was actually coming into this, um, to be full full disclosure here, um, quite <laughs> negative on the whole thing, actually, um, because um, quite often, from my point of view, um, this is obviously a personal opinion here, that the, the success of the artwork um, hinged on the fact that they were using AI technology and it wasn't really working for me. It was kind of like, well, this isn't a great bit of... this isn't a good bit of art and the fact that you're saying it's all about AI isn't actually making it better. It's just kind of, you, it looks, you know, it's, it's bad and it's like supposed to be good because it uses AI. Um, but I think you've just opened up my, my mind a little bit from, from what you've just said. So um, I mean, thank, that's thank really, you. <laughs> that, that's like a product of the art market, right. Which is different than um, art mm. artists and other kinds of practitioners who are working within this field. Uh, the art market, of course, is trying to signal innovation um, and using it as a kind of novelty, which is not really what we're interested in or talking about, actually. Yeah. Mm, yeah, so I think um, the collaborations we have um, are always with people that actually really work with the machine learning stuff themselves. It's not just, you know, oh, I'm an artist, I add a little bit um, with two clicks machine learning and AI to my um, product. Um, that doesn't work for us. Um, so. And there are a lot of people out who now for years have worked with uh, machine learning. So I think um, it's a good time. Awesome. So you, you've built this kind of space and obviously you've um, at Servitine and, and other spaces, you've been exploring these sorts of technologies already and the design museum, as you said previously. Um, do you have kind of like a, a heading? So you're producing this um, new collaboration space, I guess? Yeah, we've positioned it as a lab. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So uh, what is the kind of um, the hope for the lab, let's say? I don't have any hopes. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I mean, um, yeah, it just, I, I think, I don't think we, uh, I think um, there is not really a trajectory. Um, it's not for us, you know, a, a company where we think, oh, in the end, we need this product. For us, it was just, um, we were just interested in collaborating and sort of it grew more organically. And then by now, um, we have a research project together with NYU in New York, uh, New York University, about um, uh, um, generatic, uh, generative adversarial uh, networks and their aesthetics and with Rezome, the new museum there. And um, we just try to sort of broaden our view, learn ourselves and then try to document it and share it. That would be my trajectory. But there's not the big like, oh God, we're going to be the real big player and everybody say, oh yeah, if and Mercedes, they are so important in the creative <laughs> AI world. <laughs> That's absolutely oh, not what? <laughs> what I was thinking about. Probably wrong. Probably because I'm a woman, I have no, not a big vision. <laughs> I, I, I work on that. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe we'll have organically like he's <laughs> i mean i guess like our vision is very humble in the sense that we are trying to reverse some of exactly what you said so you said when i come to the gallery space what i see is the front end mm. and actually through working with artists sort of like deeply embedded in their projects over the span of our um, digital department which has now been running for about six years we are we understand that back end and there's a, um, probably an even more interesting story to tell than what you were seeing in the gallery. So I guess the hope is to sort of open up that space 
um, for other artists, for other institutions, and also for you know visitors and our audience to be able to participate in the back end. Since you know institutions are sort of slow moving spaces, and they're you know while we do lots of different kinds of programming, essentially the exhibition is still considered the kind of moment when you engage with art. Mm, true. And I guess, um, I mean, that, that leads me on to another question about um, historically, you've had the gallery space has had to deal with this sort of transitional period in the past where they've had to deal with um, television and um, this kind of new screen technologies uh, and then the Internet um, and how you present these different types of mediums in the gallery space. And, and do you think there's a, a a new consideration that's having to be talked about with AI technologies, or is it kind of a continuation, basically more of the same problematic curation stuff with new media? <laughs> no? Is that for me? <laughs> Probably, yeah. <laughs> um, I would say it's very much a continuation. And I think, you know, there's... In fact, a lot of the sort of like paradigms that it brings to the surface have nothing to do with the technology itself. For instance, something Mercedes and I are thinking a lot about with this lab and that, you know, we think about in the digital department at Serpentine is the fact that, you know, often there's this, um, how do you describe it? Like this dichotomy of the artist whose name is on the poster and then the entire mm -hmm. infrastructural team that worked on it. And they're actually, you know, what they're doing is deeply creative. They're having huge impact on the work, um, but somehow the art field isn't ready to accept them as artistic practitioners. And of course that comes with all kinds of logistical, monetary, uh, contractual um, mess that belongs to kind of problems of art institutions. Um, and this is just an opportunity to bring those to the fore. It's really nothing, really nothing new. <laughs> yeah. And I guess uh, as, um, a, as an extension of that, you've also got the kind of the data and where the data is coming from, possibly part of that process in, in some instances as well. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a really exciting time now because people, people do care about those other layers of the work, especially things like, you know, since Trevor Paglin and Kate Crawford, um, were able to actually make like mainstream headline news, people do really care about the fact where that, where their data is coming, where the labor is coming from, like tagging data and things like that. And all of those questions are things that um, take a kind of specialty knowledge, which most curators are not being trained in at the moment. Um, so we t we, ha we have to address the fact that there's like a huge amount of internal knowledge um, that we need to learn as curators in order to be like successfully addressing those ethical issues um, you know, when we produce projects and when we present them to the public. I guess you'll see less um, curators needing a PhD in curation and more of them needing um, programming skills. <laughs> yeah. Or rather, like the the knowledge of like what it all means, you know. Yeah, and and really deep interest in mm. that kind of technical side. Yeah. Um, so, guys, uh, how how is your technical side? <laughs> <laughs> how is our our technical knowledge? It's fine. Um, you don't have to answer that, really. <laughs> no, no. I'm, well, definitely, we're gonna answer that one. So, uh, <laughs> quite good. I mean, I work about. Um, I did my PhD on the early protocols of uh, the internet before, uh, so until TCP IP came along. So I worked on uh, technical aspects all my life um, and learned programming quite early, but I'm not active programming anymore since quite a long time. But I still read computer science papers and read the machine learning papers that come out, you know, on Archivex um, rather than reading books or magazine articles. and. Um, I mean, you know, it's uh, astounding. It's also astounding for me as a researcher that sociologists think, oh, the questions of ethics, we are needed. We need to ask, we social scientists need to ask the questions of ethics. But well, once you start reading computer science papers, you understand that these questions are actually you asked within the community of uh, machine learners and, you know, and computer scientists. It's not that 
uh, ethics is not a debate that's going on in computer science. And that I find quite good. Um, so I think, um, yeah, I think the while I don't think people that work with machine learning all need to know how to do it, they must have knowledge of it. And you need to, you know, understand um, the nitty gritty details, what takes time, um, what's the issue, where's machine learning going at the moment, um, yeah, and stuff like this. So I'm more I'm more following the general development, which is at the moment in language, while before until 2016 it was in image recognition, and um, try to understand where the issues come up in those fields then. We, we should also say that we're developing um, a resource for sort of a kind of like a halfway house um, for artists who are maybe intimidated by, you know, just diving into GitHub and trying to look for various models or like trying to edit them in TensorFlow and things like that. So what we're doing is kind of providing an edited um, database for creative AI tools for artists with information about all of those tools, how they're used and things like that. And then they can go like after figuring out what exactly it is that they want to do, then they can go um, and research that tool. Because I think it can be very intimidating for artists who are yeah. interested in the topic to figure out how to get into it. Yeah, definitely. And I think that would be really useful. Um, so would that be appearing on the lab website eventually? Great. Yeah. So go there and check that out because... There are a lot of, you know, like you just said, like there are things like TensorFlow and like machine learning and things like this. And it's like, what do these things actually mean? And and how do I actually use them and get on board with these sorts of things can be quite daunting, um, especially if you are a traditional sculptor, whatever, you know, not used to necessarily um, doing a lot of um, hands-on programming or interest in technology generally um but you could be augmenting your work in these really interesting ways um or using this material new material um so that's um that's really good do you have any examples of artworks which are successful um to your mind or you know that you think is good or interesting um which use this technology that we can maybe go and see in google and that sort of thing not google search don't, don't go uh <laughs> and find out about um if I, who are our favorite artists um there's uh um uh, well, spontaneously uh to my mind please add uh is, um uh anna riedler Memo, so she works with uh, data sets and uh, creates her own data sets and um, cleans them and runs them and has quite interesting projects. But it's also always super interesting to hear her talk about her work, if you can find a video online, because she's very good in explaining uh, her work. And then uh, one of my favorite artists is Memo Acton, um, who is really do like absolutely great for opening up interfaces and how machine learning interfaces work. Mm, awesome. Thanks. Ava? Yeah, he's definitely a kind of pioneer. Um, we worked with him on a project, um, a digital commission last year uh, with the artist Yana Sutella and the poet and programmer Alison Parrish um, together with the Memo Acton. Um, the work uh, was called or is called e magma and um it's a work that uses both cryptography and machine learning to ask sort of bigger questions about um collective consciousness and uh, maybe like a search for meaning within randomness uh, randomness obviously being like a very key tenant of cryptography um so the work is both a physical installation of um, blown glass lava lamps in the shape of the artist to tell us head, and also um, the creation of a machine oracle that predicts our collective futures. And it communicates that via an app that um, also delivers daily push notifications at noon every day. London time, it's like my favorite time of day. <laughs> Um, so the, the blown glass lava lamp heads have a camera mounted to them and the lava movement acts as a kind of randomized input generating this oracle's language. Um, the use of the lava lamp as a pseudo-random number generator 
is a reference to Lavarant, which is a hardware random number generator invented by Silicon Graphics. And um, with Imagma, rather than uh, using that sequence of numbers uh, generated by the lava's movement to encrypt, it's actually um, sort of searching for meaning. And that um, number sequence is then prompting a text generation model um, that's been trained on mystical religious texts. And there's also like this human element of the algorithm where the artist, Yena, is herself going through and, and selecting the, um, the kind of push notifications and uh, divinations that you receive through um, interacting with the app. I can give you an example from December 19th, one of my favorites, the sun was called fire. <laughs> and they've been really good recently of like this, the water will come, like just these beautiful kind of um, hallucinatory uh, texts. Mm. Um, but obviously, it's like kind of thinking about altered states of consciousness, the creation of artificial intelligence, sort of like deep dreaming, computational systems that mimic the brain, neural networks and things like that. Um, and actually it uses like a pretty straightforward um, text generation model that's been designed by Alison Parrish, but it's able to kind of tap into all of these other ideas that are very uh, integral to uh, Yana's practice. Um, and anyone can download the app eMagma and experience that for themselves. Great! It sounds um, it sounds like it's layered, <laughs> um, deeply layered. Deeply layered. <laughs> I'm I'm almost imagining um, a a very large hall full of um, these lava lamps and and taking it to like the nth extent and then ha actually it producing some sort of AI, uh, like intelligent um, self-awareness. Um, <laughs> Here, I have mine from today. <laughs> e Magma, the north wind was lost. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Fab. No, um, it's quite good. There's really, there's so much going on. So some people are working with language like um, this project or also Alison Parrish um, is working with um, and then others are working with uh, images like Robbie Barrett, for example, who did a very good thing on um, sampling nude images from online and uh, sort of mashing them to really interesting nudes. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's worth checking it out. Awesome. Thanks. On that thread, will you also have a, um, a place in your project on your website that will kind of showcase some of these um, projects that you might want to engage with um, or artists that are producing in this area? I think uh, rather than showing final works, we'll have more uh, like essays and interviews on their thinking. Yep. I think mm. there's other spaces where, where those works are sort of being broadcast, but it's this very specific thing about the process that we're yeah. interested in bringing forward. Yeah, so the Creative AI Lab website is more for collaboration and for material to then it's not an exhibition space. Yeah. And obviously there's things like Rhizome and, and places like that and yeah. Ars Electronica and other institutions that I don't know about who obviously doing have been doing a lot of this already, um, showcasing some of these um, works, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, so for the final question, um, guys, um, <laughs> Would you like to tell me <laughs> how you feel about AI and how in the future it excites you and um, how it scares you um, in this area? What is it that you're excited about or scared of with AI technology? <laughs> I feel very good about AI. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> yeah, no. Um... I think um, there's more uh, general aspect that scares me is that people uh, seem to be very suspicious of it and they don't want to engage with it. So there's this tendency by the general audience to uh, rather discuss if there will be a super AI ruling us all than actually being willing to understand, okay, there's this technology that's coming into my everyday life. How does it actually work? 
you know. So rather we have this big, huge ethical discussions if um, the whole world will be turned into a paperclip um, and the AI cannot be stopped, um, which is one example by Bostrom who discusses the superintelligence. But we don't have a lot of discussions about, um, yeah, what does this mean for everyday life and for my decisions in everyday life? Uh, for example, yeah, what language is supported, what isn't supported when you text stuff in, uh, and so on. So that's the the aspect that scares me because I think, um, well, if we see how digital technology has developed with social media, it wasn't always for the best. And now that we have the new technology, uh, which is a big, big step in another direction because it can um, analyze and calculate meeting, meaning, and it's but it's there's a big difficulty in analyzing meaning and no we need to really understand where does a machine learning program have difficulties in analyzing meaning and where is it strong mm -hmm. to be to understand how to work with it and we're not very interested in um, doing our homework we want to be served <laughs> but then we are very miffed that uh, we are being dominated by it mm -hmm. so yeah the human scares me most in this yes great <laughs> Yeah, I was also going to say, you know, like all of these technologies are just a reflection of the society itself. So if that scares you, you should be scared. <laughs> but no, I'm, I'm excited, especially when I see um, artists working with, with um, these technologies for all the reasons Mercedes mentioned. I mean, as long as we feel some sort of agency that we can, like, um, start to pull things apart, um, like that's where exciting and interesting things, including kind of backlash happens, which is also important. Yeah. So we, we could see some really good things happening with the artwork, reflecting on how we use these technologies in society and having that conversation and hopefully making things better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, well, thank you very much, both of you, for your time. Um, if people want to um, contact you, find out about you, how can they do that? Email. <laughs> Google us. And I think um, my email is on the King's College website, Mercedes Brands King's College London. And then there is my email. And I read it every day. Likewise, you can email me at Ava j at serpentinegalleries.org I don't read my email every day <laughs> <laughs> no that's a lie I wish I didn't read it every day <laughs> well I don't read it on Saturday cool well thank you very much for your time both of you and um, um, I'm feeling a, a lot more enlightened so I am um, I thank you thank you <laughs> Hi, welcome to the end of the podcast. Thanks again to Ava and Mercedes. This is a little bit of an experiment, having three of us on video calls to make this uh, podcast happen. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this kind of specific dive into AI and art. Um, let us know what you thought about the subject matter and the three-way conversation. I might in future look into specific dives with a broader category of individuals, two, three, four experts at a time to, to really dive into how AI is affecting a specific area or sector. Thanks again for listening and if you'd like to hear more from us then check out the Patreon. It's patreon.com forward slash machine ethics where you can find reading lists, other materials, discussion, videos and more. Or check out our other episodes at machine-ethics.net. Thanks again for listening. Bye.